I want to thank each and every one of my viewers. I really appreciate each of you and your comments. I have noticed uh, some people are critical of the diverse amount of subjects I have. I have some humor, I have some politics, I have some law, and I have some literature, psychology, health, all kinds of topics. And some people get upset because I kind of approach this like a vlog, I do it live, and I do if, if you want something really polished, you're going to have to go to another channel. Unless you don't mind a little bit of stuff casual, uh, like a vlog. But anyway, to get to the subject that I'm covering today, I don't really talk about real estate that much, even though I've been a Virginia real estate agent since 2007, and I'm currently licensed. I've seen a lot of things go on in the real estate industry. And I've done residential and commercial property, very expensive property and very, very cheap teardown types of property. So I've seen the gamut of different kind of people and on my, during slow periods when things are kind of slow, I'll sign up for classes and I wound up getting degrees and getting more educated as I go along and I was thinking to myself this system is untenable I will get things coming from the Realtors Association about how they're gonna lobby Congress to change the laws to make it more beneficial to the Realtors Association to the listing services etc etc so basically if you work as a real estate agent like I'd say 90% of them it's like a gig economy and it's been a gig economy for decades the ones that make the top money are very unique but I will say that a lot of people that make money in real estate are the people that there's different ways to make it but if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics and you think oh I'm gonna be wealthy by being a real estate agent you can but you've got to invest a lot of money and a lot of time and that is the key you don't even need a college degree I got into real estate uh, before I got my bachelor's degree and um, now you know I've got a graduate degree but and I'm working on another one so this is the thing that I wanted to kind of give you a little introduction and background before I go ahead and talk about this lawsuit that was brought last year and the latest ruling so basically there was this lawsuit that was brought last year let's see um, hang on well let me just get the link for it and that way it'll be easier Okay, so you're, you've got these links below as well. You can follow along if you want. I'm just going to briefly give you this. Whoops, I opened a new. I don't know why I did that. I I, I, I opened a new window, and then I, I was going to stick it in the browser, but I opened the wrong window. So I've got dark mode on for my browsers because I'm light sensitive. So anyway, this is the lawsuit that was brought. This is a brief it is a class action against the National Association of Realtors and I just kind of want to give a little bit of my observation and opinion on this there are a lot of businesses in the United States and business models that are set up like monopolies with service districts and um, it's set up in a way that they're not supposed to be doing things a certain way but then they wind up doing it that way because they find a loophole so they're alleging that this is like a monopoly, it's making prices higher, and the fees are too high, and so on and so forth. Now the only people they are including in this are people that in the last five years from the time this was filed, which was 2000, and I think the case was originally filed in 2019, but it was in, in um, March. This is a brief for the case. It says number 84, and the case has a number. If you look up here, this is the case number. Okay. So this is not the entire case history. 
but they basically did consolidate their class action and they're limiting it to people that have worked for some of the big companies when they when they did this so they're not using some of the smaller outfits but a lot of the smaller outfits use and when I say outfits I mean brokerages okay because typically the real estate agent has a broker this is probably getting kind of boring for you, so I'm 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 gonna jump ahead actually, because I'm thinking if I was listening to this and I wasn't a real estate agent, I really wouldn't want to go through all these details. I'd be like, give it to me in a nutshell. Okay, so basically, it's kind of a racket being a real estate agent, and it's very difficult to make money doing it. You have to invest a lot of money. Now, some people have a lot of money at their disposal. But the thing is, real estate agents don't have to be that educated. You can get in without a high school diploma and just have a GED and sell real estate. You just have to pass a multiple choice test and take some classes, get, you know, 60 hours or whatever. But the test is very hard, but you can take the test as many times as you want. And the test is not really that prohibitively expensive. It's not like the California bar or one of the bar exams, I can't remember the last time, well, I took mine in 2005 initially, and then I just kept taking the continuing education, so I didn't have to pay as much. I just have to pay a fee to the uh, state, the state uh, regulates me, so I pay the state, and then a fee to the National Association of Realtors, a fee to the MLS listing service and so on and so forth so anyway a lot of people don't realize this and I remember during the 2007 crash a lot of people would glare at me at church and other places and make derogatory comments about real estate agents as if it was the real estate agents fault that the bottom fell out and houses that were valued at 306,000 were now valued at 150,000 like they lost half their value in one year one fell swoop well the real estate agent is a gig worker basically okay and people don't realize that the real estate agent is a gig worker the media the mainstream media puts on these shows like million dollar real estate they show people like the Cochrane Group uh, lady that's on a TV show, how uh, wealthy they are. They, sh they even use Trump as an example of how you can make money in real estate. Trump is not a real estate agent. His dad was not a real estate agent. People think real estate money. Real estate is an investment, okay? It's a good investment land and property is unique but that's not the issue here it's how the money is being spread up around and who is being paid so basically the six percent fee you're not allowed to set fees it's an antitrust thing right so they do this thing this wink wink thing where they're like the broker is going to get three percent the buyer broker is going to get 3%, the seller broker is going to get 3%, and then the real estate agent and the broker will have their own agreement on what the split is. Usually the people at the top, the cream of the crop, they'll let them do like uh, a different split, the commission split, but there's kind of like an unspoken rule among the bigger companies. We're going to set it at 6%. Now, I worked for a company where we set it at 1.5 percent and we would advertise to all the buyers and sellers that instead we had a different model and we had a contract so we didn't go with what the big companies do so i couldn't even enjoy this lawsuit because i uh went to brokers that were smaller and had a different split but so in if you look in the case let's look at the case they have people in the last five years that are real estate agents, okay, that worked for the big companies, uh, Caldwell Banker, Century 21, the Cochrane Group, Berkshire Hathaway, which is 
kind of big. This is a 72 page document. Okay. So this is the thing back in, let's see, where can I start? Back when I uh, started real estate, they already had internet. And when I was taking my real estate education classes for my licensing, the instructor told us that it used to be they had these books that they would print up and try to update and then you'd have inserts for them and everything was done manually and cataloged and you had to go physically down to the courthouse and get the paperwork on the plats of land. Now what they're doing with the internet is they're putting up the layouts of all the houses and all the information on the web. And the internet has not caught up. The laws on privacy and things like that have not caught up with the technology. If you had to drive down physically and get the layout of a house, where the septic tank was, the property history and all that, normally you get, at closing, you get a you pay somebody to, to do a title history and search to make sure the land is free and clear and everything. The real estate agent usually doesn't do that. You, you pay other people to do that. But the thing is, you real estate agents have to pay all these dues, and then they get the brand recognition of the name of the company. But this lawsuit is going forward, and the, basically the latest thing that was done was that the judge denied the motion to the National Association of Realtors to dismiss the buyer commission lawsuit. So it's basically on the price fixing of the commission. But the judge is like, look, if it wasn't for this flat price fixing, real estate agents would get a lot less money. See, she says, look, Plaintiffs would have paid substantially lower commissions if not for the buyer broker rules. Well, you know, that's the opinion of Judge Andrea Wood, but the thing is, maybe they would have lower commissions, but what if they were salaried? There's a new model out for real estate agents where they're salarying uh, some of these agents, like Redfin. And Redfin uh, will hire some agents on, but they're hiring less agents and they're automating. Whereas with the old model, it's gig work. They get as many people as they can and they try to have you use your sphere of influence. They think most people have at least 200 people's sphere of influence. And they're going on an old, archaic model before the internet. And so, you know, you could make a living, but nowadays with the internet, it's harder to make a living and they're letting more people in. So, of course, naturally, there's going to be more disgruntled people, but also the public perception of what's going on in the real estate industry and how they market real estate sales and everything like that. Nowadays, most people don't even wind up owning their homes. Most people just refinance them that they're, it's their biggest invest, uh, investment and they keep cashing out on equity because what happens is you'll get a 35-year mortgage or a 40, 45, I think it's a 45, 30. There's different mortgage products. There's 15, 30, and now 45. Now, normally the real estate agent just knows a little bit about the finance, but they send them over to a lender and they, they have to give them at least three lenders. It's illegal for them to steer them in, into any one. There's all this antitrust law. So you say here, I these are the ones uh, that I'm familiar with, but you can pick anybody you want. And um, so basically this, this problem with the monopoly on the real estate is the Realtors Association is a big, kind of like, it's a big... Would I call it a, what are those things called? I'm having a, a union, okay? The Realtors Association is like a union. And, but it has a high ethical standard. 
And so they lobby Congress, and they're in bed with the banks. Now the localities, the banks, what they do is they make a lot of money on your house. Let's say you buy a house for 120000 in uh, a really strange area, like way out in the country. I, I, I kid you not, you can buy houses for that much. They they will see one here's a house right here, sixty nine thousand dollars. But where is it? It's in Cadillac, Minnesota. I don't know where Cadillac, Minnesota is. Um, so there's always a catch. There could be a nuclear a power plant near it. There could be uh, toxic water. You know, like let's say you want to buy a house in Flint, Michigan. Well, we know the water is not potable there, so let's see. Did I spell Flint, Mich Michigan wrong? All right, let's. So, okay, so the banks will. Uh, the banks will sell. Look, the twenty thousand dollars for this house. Seventeen thousand uh, dollars, seventeen square foot, eleven dollars. Here's one for sixty-five. Okay, now let's say you bought a house for nineteen, twenty thousand, whatever. This house is ninety-nine. If you bought that house, the same house, same size house, same square footage, in a wealthy suburb of D.C or on the outskirts of it, you'd be paying 500000 or higher, five times more. So with real estate, it's location, but it's also amenities. And basically, they do have public sewers and water. It's not that they're out in the country so much. It's that their water is toxic because the locals decided that most of the people that live in those areas don't deserve fresh water and we want to have the corporation here that's going to dump the poisonous water into the to the to, to the water and we want to give them money they're going to pay us off so it's an ethics issue so what does the bank do when they have all these properties that have decreased in value due to the water I don't know. Do they move the people out of the area? What if the people don't have money to move? They're trying to move. They're selling it at a loss. Whatever. So let's say you buy a house for sixty-five thousand with a thirty-year mortgage. Okay. This is just a general estimation. You buy a house for sixty-five thousand. You got a thirty-year mortgage at five percent interest or whatever. At the end of the 30 years, so you're paying off interest plus principal. And um, I get the principles mixed up. Yeah, okay, so, so interest plus principal. And at the if you stayed there the entire 30 years, your house would be worth two hundred thousand at the end of the time, but you would have paid two hundred thousand with your interest, your real estate taxes. You might even pay more because as the house ages, you have to replace all the appliances every couple of years. You got to paint all the walls. You got to carpet, refloor. You got to upkeep the home maintenance. So besides, besides paying your mortgage, which now is at the end of the the entire time, it's going to be triple the amount you originally paid. 
in between you have to pay all this money on maintenance and upkeep, right? So now the thing is, oh, I spelled main, main, excuse me, ten minutes. Is that a main, main ten Okay, sorry. Um, so, oh, excuse me. Okay, so real estate agents are gig workers, right? M most of them, not all. They're licensed gig workers and they work on commission only. And it's pay to play. They invest money in the dues for all the different agencies. You've got your lockbox, your signs, your keys. They have electronic keys now that are like, okay, so when they set up the districts with the MLS, it's an agreement between the MLS service that works with the Realtors Association that works with these other, these keys, uh, electronic keys. They put them on the door. The agent has access to them. You have to pass a moral background check. Now, you might, if you want to sell your own, let's say you want to sell your own house, and you want real estate agents to show it to, um, basically, there's, there's different, you know, there's ways around it. You don't have to have this, but this is the typical old-fashioned key. I have this, um, but they're not using this anymore. They've got an updated key. It's really a pain in the neck because these buttons are really small. And, um, but anyway, you have to pay for all these. You have to pay, you know, 150 bucks. And then you, you have to pay for your, for printing your internet, all this other stuff. And your client doesn't realize about all the overhead you have. And the realtors associations, the MLS, the entire racket, where they have CEOs and stuff that make a lot, make salaried income and have insurance the real estate agents just a gig worker throwing money out throwing money to pay uh, all these fees and then they have to pay for their own health care take out their own Medicare their own Social Security but when they get done at the end of the year and they sit down and give their information you have to keep all their receipts give their information to an accountant. The accountant's like, okay, we're going to look at this, we're going to look at this. Oh, uh, you don't really have to pay that many taxes because you spent this amount of money. You know, you got a cell phone bill, you got to have equipment, you got to pay car maintenance. So if you're, if you're using it 80% of the time, that depends on what you're doing. But so basically, the real estate agent is a gig worker. But they call it 1099, and they've had this model ever since I've been in it. And so the 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 people, so when you go to sell a house, it's 100% commission, but you have to spend a whole bunch of money. And then your commission split with the broker. And typically, they give you 1.5% of the closing for the sale. The broker gets, this is the typical arrangement, but you're not allowed to do that, but this is the typical arrangement by the big companies. And then the other company does 1.5%. And we're taught right away, wink, wink, you can do whatever you want. It's whatever the contract says. But if your broker says to you, look, this is the agreement we have. You sign a contract. You get 1.5% as a seller agent. You get 1.5% as a buyer. Is there dual agency? Dual agency 
is where you are the buyer and the seller representative and that is not allowed in some states it's allowed in Virginia but you have to do a disclosure form for that in other words I can list your house for sale in Virginia if you agree to the disclosure uh, that you'll do dual agency and I can find a uh, and I've actually done that I've been the listing agent and I've found the buyer I've gone and showed the property to them walked them around and I've sold them the home so I got a I got instead of 1.5 percent at closing I got three percent at closing because I got both of the splits so that's the common arrangement they have and I think that's the contention of the suit it's that a lot of these have an industry standard where the big big companies decide we're gonna have you know a split 50 50 in most cases now look in more competitive foreign markets home buyers pay their brokers if they choose to use one and they pay less than half the rate paid to buyer brokers in the United States in comparable international markets with out a rule like a buyer broker commission rule such as the United Kingdom Germany Israel Australia New Zealand buyer brokers when they are used are paid directly by the home buyers that is the way it's set up here but they're not paid directly when you go to closing what happens is it's taken out of the loan kind of off the top of the loan and it's figured in so is the commission for the for the lender uh, broker because they have brokerage on the lending end too rather than by home sellers wait a minute I think do they know what they're talking about when they go to closing right the buyer takes out a loan well I guess it depends on how you want to spin it you could say it's taken off the price from the sale of the home and then say the home seller's paying for it. Okay, okay, the home seller's paying for it. As an article in the Wall Street Journal recently explained, real estate brokers have shielded themselves with a skine of anti-competitive practices that have kept the high fees they charge unchanged since 1991. The total broker fees that have been imposed are significantly higher than those paid elsewhere in the developed world. And if they were instead paid at a competitive level, American consumer, consumers would save tens of billions of dollars annually. Jack Ryan and Jonathan Friedland, when you buy or sell a home, Realty Bites. That's, so they're, they're using a Wall Street article as evidence of this billions of dollars this is not a scientific study it's a journalist article so if that's all they got as their argument they need to have a study but anyway the defendants conspiracy may, has maintained broker commission levels at remarkably stable and inflated levels for the past two decades here's my contention the broker does the broker has more overhead okay they have to pay for the commercial real estate that they're running the office space at and they have to pay for uh, broker fees which are higher than realtor agent fees and they have to pay like if they're in a franchise like Keller and Williams they have to pay franchise fees so it says Keller Williams buyer brokers were charging an average commission of 2.71% in 2015, an amount virtually unchanged from the 2.8%. So, moreover, because housing prices have increased substantially during this period at a rate significantly exceeding inflation. Okay, here's the thing <coughs> the houses are very they're 
the price is based on I showed you this model here with the location okay you've got banks here okay you've got other players going on you have local districts okay and I, I talk about locations because they plan their budgets based on the value of the real estate tax they charge every year. Now, for some reason, let's take Flint, Michigan. And I don't know why, you know, I don't know, I'd have to look into this more, but Flint, Michigan allowed uh, a huge corporation in there. And the corporation was attracted to the area so that they could get jobs, so that they, they could have, like the income tax in the state is based on uh, your income in the state. There's only a few states that don't have income tax. Florida is one of them. But, so if you have a residence in, in, in a state that doesn't have an income tax, then you don't have to, I don't know how that works because I've always been in a state where you have to pay. But, so there's a lot of players here. You've got local governments. Okay, and so you have planners. And for some reason, and I honestly think some of it's racist because in Flint, the areas that got affected with the water were low income well not necessarily I don't know if they're all low income but anyway you 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 could see we looked at Flint Michigan a minute ago and so when I'm looking at this legal argument here as an experienced real estate agent in Virginia and just looking at the big picture so they're talking about how the, the price of the sold homes have rose, according to the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is going based on the, the price of homes between 2001 and 2007 go up because of real estate taxes, local real estate taxes, local insurance. Okay, so you have the insurance industry in here too. So you're looking at a bulwark of why you pay so much for houses. It's like people complaining about why when I want to invest in bettering myself and go to college, do I have to pay so much money if I don't have money up front? So we have a bulwark network of intertwined lobbying, oh, excuse me, lobbying interests. So these people will lobby Congress for different things. Now with localities what they like to do is they like to get government grants for redevelopment or increasing the property values because if they can increase the property values and they can also create what's called service districts in areas like for example I live on a, in an area more rural I'm on a well we don't have city water or sewer so I don't have a water bill but the problem is uh, the water needs treatment. It's a shallow well and it's acidic and it's eating away my copper pipe slowly. Uh, and now that I've had experience with that, I could warn home buyers to get their water tested. But as a real estate agent, I don't really have to. I mean, I should know, but you know, there's this non disclosure thing, which is a crime of omission you have a fiduciary duty as a real estate agent so basically real estate agents are kind of at the bottom of the rung they're running around 
They're very vulnerable and they're spending money. And so they're like, I, we ought to sue for this because this, this thing is a racket. We're paying all this money. They're telling us we can only get 1% and we're doing all this work and we're closing the deals for them, you know? And it's this gig work is horrible. So let's sue. Um, let's change the system. Let's make it more fair. So they go talk to some lawyers and lawyers are like, hmm, is there any money in this? Let's take a quick analysis. Let's see how much money this NR, uh, National Association is, is, is raking in every year, whatever. So they're looking to see if, it, if it's worth their time and energy to do all this research and, and work. And they're like, well, you know, this does kind of walk like a duck talk like a duck, smell like a duck, whatever. Let's take the lawsuit. So they get people in different uh, districts and they file, you can have a diversity case, but with, you have to have the right district when you file something. Now, I don't know why they chose Chicago, Illinois, but I do know that they have people from all over the country, because if you look at the very bottom of this, they have people people in every state. Now, if you're a real estate agent and you want to enjoin this suit, I don't know if you can, but here's all the places they said not in my district, they use the bright MLS. Okay. I don't work for one of the big companies, so I can't even enjoin this if I wanted to. It's just the bright MLS. Here's, they're talking about the listing service you have to pay for. So you have to pay all these sues. Okay. So they're asking for injunctive relief, the cost of the lawsuit, reasonable attorney fees, treble damages, antitrust laws alleged herein. So basically, for violating these antitrust laws, and basically when we were taking classes, it was like wink, wink. The commission can be whatever you want, but here's what we do here. <coughs> and most brokerages do this because it's like, kind of like a wink wink consensus you know so the answer to this question and the multiple choices because of antitrust laws the prices are not fixed but they really are and um, you know you can round down the numbers by a small 0.01 percent and still be about the same so the court has subject matter jurisdiction okay so this is what I was kind of like looking for here 28 USC, this is the law, whenever you do legal briefs, you got to show what the law is, you know, and if there is a law that you can, can uh, claim relief. Now, they, they, they want to set an example out of these people. This would be great because it would help the consumers, right, according to the Wall Street ar article, but how do you know that's going to help the consumer? I just, I just want you to stop and think, is that going to help the consumer if they they do that? I think it might help the consumer, to be honest with you, because I don't know if it's going to help the real estate agents. But yes, I think it'll help the real estate agents because I don't think real estate agents, you know, you got to invest about five grand your first year. And I'm talking about education and everything else. And, you know, advertising and Sometimes the first year you hardly make anything at all. You know, don't quit your day job. So these real estate agents want some relief and they say they don't like doing stuff that is uh, not on the up and up. But the problem here and what I'm getting at with this lawsuit is the local governments have a vested interest in raising the values of the property because they can raise the amount they can get for their operating budget, which means they can give salaries and insurance and cushy jobs to their government people. Uh, the courts, the local courts, also get money from this as well. And you don't think that all this stuff's in, in, intertwined, but it is. So you have homeowner's insurance. Now, if you live in an area like that's below sea level, like Louisiana, it's very hard to get flood insurance, and the insurance is really high. <coughs> so 
your location again is something to think about when you have real estate. So these agents are not happy and I can understand why because that's why I've diversified, that's why I've gone to school. But being a gig worker is not the most fun. You know, recently, I think it was Uber, but they're not suing for being gig workers. They're suing for the setting of the commissions, the antitrust, the Sherman. But I, I, I can't say that I know enough. So they have a, a, a bunch of different people. Um, so he works for Remax. Remax is one of the ones they're going to do. So like I said, they only have the biggest companies. These other articles... Show now the defendants are the National Association of Realtors that has 1.2 million individual members and it's one of the largest lobbying groups in the country advocating for the interests of the real estate brokers, not for the real estate agents. Now, I don't know what it is in other states. I do know I had a relative in California that was a California real estate agent. They use the names differently. We have in Virginia an agent and then a broker. So they could be using it that way. Anyway, it's 54 state and territorial real, realtor association and over 1,200 realtor associations are members of the NAR headquartered in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, so that's why they're using Chicago. NAR is, net, is in, in the Midwest. Now, really, Re Realology Holding Corp. is the nation's largest real estate brokerage company. It's headquartered in Madison, New Jersey. It's a publicly traded corporation with a market value in excess of $4 billion. It owns, operates, and franchises and many real estate brokerage firms, including Century 21, Coldwell Banker, Sotheby's International Realty, the Cochran Group, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate, Zip Realty, ERA Real Estate, City Habitats, and Climb Real Estate. Okay, so that's why you would have to be working for one of these firms to enjoin the suit. Okay, so I did work with uh, a, the big one of these big companies, and I found out that it was more of a racket, and I wanted to switch to another one, because as an agent, they ask you to pay for uh, advertising on their website. It's almost like you're paying like franchise fees, and then they micromanage a lot of stuff you do. So I went to a smaller mom-and-pop brokerage after that, but unfortunately one of them I went to wound up selling because it costs so much. It's very hard for the smaller mom and pop ones to compete against this big re rheology holdings. And I guess when you go to Coldwell Banker, there's no difference between Coldwell Banker and Century 21 or Sotheby's or Cochrane Group or Better Homes and Garden because they're all part of the same company. They have an umbrella company. So as to not look like a monopoly, you know, the insurance industry and other corporations do this a lot, too. You think you're getting one um, broadcaster for, like when I took communications, you think you're getting uh, Time Warner, NBC, CBS, uh, Comcast, all these, uh, these holdings are under this huge umbrella, and you think you, you've got a choice... But you really don't. But anyway, it says Defendant Home Services of America is the second largest. Oh, they have more. Okay. So the second largest HSA is the majority holder of Prudential, Home Services, Long and Foster, a large private residential real estate company in the United States, BHH. Anyway, I don't, then they have the Remax. You've heard of them. Keller and Williams, one of the nation's largest brokerage headquartered in Austin, Texas, is a privately held company. It franchises Keller Williams broker, brokers around the country. They have a book um, for sales and stuff. 
Their setup's a little different. Co-conspirators. The multiple local realtor associations not named as defendants participated as co-conspirators in the violations alleged herein and performed acts and made statements in furtherance thereof. Specifically, each of the local realtor associations that own and operate the 20 covered MLSs, among other realtor associations in other areas of the country, agreed to comply with an implemented buyer broker commission rule. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to argue here with this because I think there's some merit to it. Now, there's a lot more stuff going on than just this. There's a lot more layers. But anyway, according to the NAR, 92% of sellers sold their home with the assistance of a real estate broker. 87% of buyers purchased their home with the assistance of a real estate broker. Well, here, it's the biggest purchase of your life. And on top of that, you really need um, expert legal advice, but real, real estate agents can't be giving legal advice. They can't practice law without a license. So they're going to have to refer you to a lawyer. They can give you some basic generalizable information or show you, uh, you know, basic information. But anyway, so this anti-competitive agreement and everything. So I don't know if they're going to, be able to go up against this because in Congress the legislation there's too many layers here is what I'm trying to say and there are banks the banks are a big one okay and the feds <coughs> so um, and the stock market now remember the last stock market crash The big one uh, that caused the Great Recession, that was all to do with banks and real estate. So, I really think they should change this model and this structure to make it more fair for people. But here's what the thing is, the banks are making all the money. They're, because the, the homeowner and the real estate agent really isn't making a lot of money. Because you have to upkeep the house. And when you buy the house, yeah, it increases in value. But the thing is, how much have you spent? It's almost like you're being played. How much have you spent after all this investment? Now, they have these private investors that like to flip properties. And I think they work with the banks because HUD. Now, I'm going off on a tangent here. And I need to stop. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop myself. Okay. Here's what I'm going to tell you. They have a lawsuit. I don't know if they're going to win. Because I think the courts could wind up ruling to go ahead and keep the racket going. And you know why? Because right now, the way they got it set up, too many people are making money off the average American that's trying to own a home, the American dream. They're making money on the loans. They're making quadruples. And then you've got the loan servicers. And then you've got the stuff being traded on the stock market. Okay? So when I say it's a racket, I mean it's a racket. Now, I, I want to go off on a little bit more of a tangent just in to do with land ownership uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do another video I think on it but I was looking in history and colonialism and how colonists move in rob people of their land <clears throat> put a price on it Native Americans did not even have this idea of ownership they, they were like the invisible, it's everybody's land. What are you talking about ownership? But anyways, we're stewards of the land, you know? So, but I think this is very interesting what's going on. And 
I'm not even sure if I want to do real estate anymore because I think the uh, the landscape has changed and <clears throat> I mean I can still help people find homes or sell homes <coughs> or rentals but <clears throat> a lot of the stuff is based on your credit rating but here's the thing there's a lot of ethical issues that are coming up in my mind and how the new technologies of the fourth industrial revolution have taken away a lot of your privacy and left you more vulnerable not less vul vulnerable in your security to be secure under the Constitution of the United States and your persons and your papers. Do you know why? Because it used to be you had to go down to the courthouse and look at these records. Now any criminal can go in and look at the layout of your house and how to rob it. And even they have drones in my areas. The drones go in and take snapshots of your property overhead invading your privacy the drones can they've used it to catch criminals in my area but I mean because we have new technologies the laws are not saying oh the government can't snoop in your house with their drone camera uh, they they can go ahead and leave the layout of your home all the entrances and the exits in your home to robbers well, if you don't have money for a security system, uh, we can sell you a security system where you can watch your house 24-7. Comcast sells it. Um, you, you can be uh, under 24 surveillance with your Amazon Echo and um, these big corporations uh, are spending money on causing the masses of people to be sort of enslaved to this whole system of of you know going to work hitting the ground running but getting very little in return how much do real estate agents get in return for all the money they have to spend to do business well they're not going to be paying as many taxes if they're not given a salary but I think what they need to do is they need to make it so that real estate agents have a minimum of a bachelor's degree, pass the licensing, and that they're all salaried, and that they check in at their brokerages. They need to just change this model completely. There's been some other models like Redfin, but I think a salary would get more taxes going back into the area it's not going to solve the problem of the banks making triple on uh, real estate and using it as leverage what the banks like to do is take advantage of the economy and foreclose on you they don't want you to own a home they want the insurance and taxes and everything to go up like they are right now and then they want some catastrophe to cause it so that you can't own the home and then they want to take it before you cash out or refinance the equity or you can just keep refinancing like a shell game because a lot of people do that a lot of people don't own their homes they keep refinancing and the thing is I always insist on a a rate where I don't have to keep refinancing because every time you refinance you are you're spending more money but people don't think about that they think about the short term you know you need to think long term but anyway you know when you've got a couple or something they both have to agree and a lot of times maybe your husband will say you got to refinance wife doesn't want to and he's like I'm the one earning all the money we're refinancing and blah 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 so the wife goes along with it but I mean that's just the way it is so this is an interesting case and it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out <clears throat> basically they are saying that the consumers need to be protected but they're also saying that uh, this is violating some of these uh, corporate laws that were set up 
and I'm not a corporate attorney. I don't know. I'm speaking to you as a real estate agent that has looked at different brokerages and decided I didn't want to work with the big ones because the big ones were costing me too much money and I wanted more of a commission. I found a place that would give me 80-20. They, they take 20%, I take 80. I like that better, right? So, but they're a small company and I don't know how long they're going to stay in business because they're, they're saying they're going to go out of business again. So here's the script to uh, explain the commission. Can you reduce your commission? Yes, I can, I can reduce it. All commissions are negotiable. Yeah, this is what they're teaching. They didn't give me a script. They just, you know, wink, wink, they told me. But then I switched jobs. Uh, I switched brokerages, and I got out of this thing with the commission. But honestly, to be honest with you, even though I had the split change, we just had this thing where, you know, it's 3% for the buyer, 3% for the seller. And that was just the industry standard. So here, here's what it says. Because the total commission is then a term of the contract between the home seller and the seller broker, NAR has created a catch-22 and warns MLS participants that actions by the buyer broker to reduce the total commission could constitute unlawful interference with the contract. Also, real estate agents are told they're not attorneys, they can't make the contracts, so they have to use the exact, they have to use the contracts that their broker decides to use, um, that are made and created by a lawyer. They can't, but they can fill in the blanks, and they have a whole bunch of different forms for different scenarios, including like amendments and changes, contingencies, things like that. So they, they lay this all out. Um, I, t I already told you without showing an ent entire script, but basically these are objections. So, anyway, the NRA has taken additional actions to restrain negotiations. So it's really funny because we have this realtors ethics of duty you know and all this list how we're a, a cut above the rest and NARS NAR standard of practice 1616 states realtors acting as sub agents or buyer tenant res representatives or brokers shall not use the terms of an offer to purchase lease attempt to modify the listing brokers office of compensation or sub agents buyer tenor tenant representatives or brokers nor make the submission of an executed offer to purchase lease contingent on the listing broker's agreement to modify the offer of compensation. In other words, it's an unequivocal violation of NAR's ethical rules for a buyer broker to even present an offer to a seller that is conditional on the seller reducing the buyer broker commission. No kidding. Well, I don't understand why they're pointing this out. All right, I'm sorry. I don't know, maybe I just kind of accepted everything without really thinking it through. NAR's case interpretations not only underscore the prohibition on the purchase offer that reduces the buyer broker commissions, but also illogically instruct buyer brokers who seek to modify buyer broker commissions to attempt those modifications before even showing the property to any potential buyers. NAR's case interpretation 1615 states the hearing panel's decision noted Realtors B was indeed entitled to negotiate with Realtor a concerning cooperating broker compensation, but that such negotiation should be completed prior to the showing of the property by Realtor B. The decision indicated that Realtor B was entitled to show the property listed by Realtor A on the terms offered by the listing broker in the MLS, emphasis added. Well, here's what I have to say. I've listed properties. 
where people have uh, come to the property because it's a short sale or something, right? And they don't have a real estate agent representing representing them, their private investors. And they want to make an offer. I've had people come up and want to pay cash for a house. And I'm like, no. I don't know. Anyway, so maybe I'm just... By requiring buyer brokers seeking to reduce buyer broker commissions to request those reductions prior to even showing the property to potential buyer, NAR forecloses virtually all negotiations over <clears throat> the buyer broker commission. That requirement implausibly contemplates that a buyer broker will unilaterally contact a selling bro broker to request a reduction to the buyer broker commission before the potential buyer has ever has even seen, let alone expect an interest in purchasing the property. So anyway, here's the thing. If you want to sell a house, you have these big corporations that own the main database for selling, the most up-to-date database, and the most the highest visibility, and they're working with the, the, the largest, some of them international real estate corporations. And they're lobbying Congress to to uh, be given special treatment and to continue their policies that they've had since, it says, at least 1991. So they've done a lot of homework on this. This is 72 pages long. They've numbered everything, 104. Um, Berkshire Hathaway's in here. And these CEOs, by the way, and COOs, make a lot of money. If you go to, and, and this is, some of the stuff's publicly traded on the, on the stock market. If you go to the banks and you uh, look at the banks, it's the same thing. You know, you'll have at least the people that work as tellers or managers at the banks they make an okay living, you know, some of them are salaried, some of them are temporary part-time, but they have a steady salary and they're taking out taxes. But if you look at the company, they try, they figure out ways to make more and more money for the top people with the golden parachutes, the people at the top of the company. So real estate, the way it's being sold right now, it could change in the United States. They're comparing us to other countries. But if you look at the long history of colonialism and real estate and property and land rights, you will see there has been a lot of abuse of power in the past. So that's the long and short of it. I don't know what's going to come out of this case. It's very interesting to me as an agent, and I imagine it might be interesting to consumers if you try to sell your house on your own, it's very difficult if you don't understand the laws, and it's probably like going to the court without a lawyer. You can be open to litigation if you sell your house yourself. And they call these FISBOs in the market. They call it for sale by owners. I could probably do another video on FISBOs. But right now, a lot of real estate agents sometimes... They, they really know how to market the house, and they do a lot of legwork, and I don't think they really get paid enough. Um, and there's way too many of them. They let too many in. And a lot of people spend a lot of money on it, and they lose steam, and there's slow periods, and it's sensitive to the economy. So the people that are really making money are the people at the top. Okay, so I'm going to put this, this, um, these links below, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion of how uh, there's a litigation going on that could be a landmark decision 
that affects how real estate is sold going forward and the business model that they have now. Uh, I'd like to see some changes made in not just the real estate industry but the banking industry and Congress and everything else because I think we have a really tangled web. I think people don't have uh, as many rights as they think they have and um, that people should have a right to be secure in their persons. I, I'm a highly, uh, I, I believe in the Constitution and I, I, I feel like even the way they have properties online, I think that should be private. If you're going to be a private owner of a home, why would you want your public, your property publicly shown who owns it and all that other stuff? the layout. Well, that's good for sales. Well, are you in sales or are you in robbery? You know? I don't know. But it's out there on the internet and I, I think that should change. I think real estate agents need to be more educated and go into this with their eyes wide open because a lot of this gig economy stuff is a racket. It's made so that the companies, the corporations don't have to make as pay as much money and they can have as much money. You can work 70 hours a week as a gig worker and make nothing and wind up spending money. How do you recoup all that investment? You know, the same thing goes with the guarantee of the student loan crisis. The banks are making all the money. You're a debt slave now. Let's say that's why young people today, a lot of them don't want to go to college. They see that student loan crisis being talked about in the news. And we need educated people to make our country strong. And colleges can do that. They can help with that. But anyway, so thanks for listening. I've talked about more than real estate here. And I've talked about real estate agents suing the National Association of Realtors based on I don't know why they don't put in there the gig worker thing because honestly that commission and all the dues they just the amount of dues and time you put some people have gotten into real estate and they've only been in one or two years, and they just quit. They say, you know, I've done my taxes twice this year, and it turns out I'm only earning 8 bucks an hour. If you think about all the hours I work, I work weekends, people want me on holidays, and then they complain that I talk them into a bad deal, or, or I'm somehow to blame for the market failing. You know, so... <clears throat> Real estate's a tough industry for agents, and I'm not surprised someone is suing them now. I'm just surprised it's taken this long. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned. I'll update you if I hear anything more. Right now, their motion to dismiss is denied. Take care. Bye.